you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And I bring you greetings from Wheaton College. Um, it, this is my first time here at Trinity, and uh, I'm just so delighted uh, to be here. Well, thank you especially to Tom uh, and to Jeffrey as well for the invitation um, to speak on the theme of divine, um, a divine activity, contingency, and modern science. My interest in this topic involved understanding mental frameworks that shaped people's experience of time and how their practices of time reckoning in the church intersect with society. And this stems from my attention to the expression of theology in context, as well as the outworking of theology in everyday life. And so my goal for our time together is to begin by exploring some of the ways that the Bible, as it was formed and used, reflects those mental frameworks, as well as plays a role into shaping them. To that end, I'd like to begin with the story of a Bible. In 1554, Jean Crespin, the Dutch Protestant, who became a printer and author in the city of Geneva, published two of his most important works. His well-known reformed martyrology, Le Livre des Martyrs, and reissue of his French Bible, La Bible. The small city of Calvin had unexpectedly become a central publishing hub within Europe for Protestant literature in the aftermath of an aggressive escalation of Protestant persecution in France during the mid-1540s. As Reformation scholar William Monter would explain, that was the decade when France's brain drain to Geneva occurred. Crespin would settle in Geneva by 1538 and turn from the law profession to running a successful printing house. His Bible was one of many vernacular Bibles published by refugee printers in the city of refuge. I recently viewed a copy of Crespin's 1554 French Bible at Cambridge University Library. But its journey from Geneva to England be began long before. The copy is significant because it reflects the way in which a Bible printed by a refugee printer for refugee Christians could experience and reflect the life of the refugee on its own pages. There are a few ways that this is evident and which relate to our focus this morning. In the first place, this copy is not just a French Bible, but it has also been rebound to include Sternhold Hopkins English metrical Psalms. So that's here on this side, in case you were wondering the differences in the language. And that, that Psalms book was uh, printed in London in 1595. The practice of binding French Bibles with the Psalms or simply publishing them with the metrical Psalms was far from unusual, but it is the bilingual dimensions of the resulting book that deserve notice. Here is reflected the way in which Francophone Protestants grappled with diaspora and sought to maintain their nat native vernacular tongue of scripture while also engaging the liturgical tongue of their refugee context. In fact, because the persecution of Francophone Protestants persisted well into the 18th century, the ongoing publication of bilingual French Bibles is a mark of the enduring impact of geographical dislocation for Francophone Protestants. I've included a few other examples for you. A picture of, this is a picture of a French Dutch version that was published in 1649. And I have as well a picture of a French-German version published in Berlin in 1742. Now the emergence of this type of Bible differs from the Renaissance humanist development of polyglot Bibles, which sought to establish a purest form of the original manuscripts in the original languages for the purpose of reforming the Latin Vulgate translation. The vernacular diglot Bible places common languages side by side for a completely different purpose. Now, spanning two worlds geographically required efficiency in two vernacular languages, as well as two different time zones. And this particular Bible is valuable for reflecting that dynamic through the writing on the inside front cover. So, right here. <laughs> 
The handwritten dating on the inside cover reflects the way in which the owner of the Bible sought to maintain the English and the continental system of dating since England continued to maintain the Julian calendar until 1752. Catholic countries had promptly embraced the 1582 Gregorian calendar, while most Protestant powers on the continent adopted a Protestant reform of the calendar before the turn of the 18th century, including in the city of Geneva. This is just one of many facets of early modern life that convey how the nature of time reckoning, which is what we'll be talking about, is never neutral, but reflects the political, economic, cultural, and certainly the confessional dynamics of the past. But turn your attention to what is actually written here. These are not numbers without purpose, but they are milestone moments selected and recorded with dating. In the cover of this French Bible bound to the English metrical Psalms is written in English, part of the story of the Mobilo family. We learned that Anne was born on the 12th of March and baptized the 22nd of March and note the dual dates, 1664 slash 1665. The dual years listed indicate how the continental system observed the start of the new year on January 1st, while the English system observed the start of the new year on March 25th, according to Bede's dating of Christ's crucifixion. The owner also records the dates of Martha Mobilo's birth and baptism, as well as Mary's, and then another Anne born in 1671. Susanna was born and baptized the same day in, again, we see 1673, 1674, and Jane the same day in 1680. The owner of this Bible indicates that these children were baptized at St. Martin's in the Field, a church first built in 1536 by Henry VIII and which continues its ministry in London today. According to the inscription, the children were baptized by Mr. Burnett, who was a reader at the church. The fact that the family was recording life events according to the month and the year is an indication of how much has changed since the 16th century regarding everyday awareness and precision of time reckoning. Okay, so now you know something about the Mobilo family living in London in the 17th century, which I'm sure you did not expect to hear about. So let's dig deeper. What did it mean to record family milestones, such as births and baptisms, other Bibles record marriages and deaths, in the front cover of your Bible? What does that mean? There's something notable going on here that provides material evidence of not only how Christians marked their devotional lives during this period, but also gives us a glimpse into their theological mentality at work. The act of writing one's birth and baptism in a Bible is the act of writing one's own sacred chronology into God's sacred story. By these recordings of infant baptism especially, their family genealogy was in a way inserted into the genealogy of scripture and rooted in the theological conviction that God's covenant embraces children within the family. The milestones of the Mobilo family life were linked then by their own hand to the story of God's family. Considering that the clergy were still the record keepers of society at the time. That, in fact, was one of their most important jobs, to record the dates of births, baptism, marriages, and deaths as official records for the state. And so it's very fascinating to see this practice emerge in the 17th century. The Protestant Reformation's promotion of vernacular Bible ownership for families, its emphasis on the priesthood of all believers, and the way in which the Bible became the focal point for personal and communal devotion all seemingly played a hand in enabling the emergence of this practice by the 17th century. Eventually, Bibles would be officially formatted to invite the inclusion of the family genealogy, 
by offering dedicated space within the Bible for recording, recording or registering family history. Maybe you're thinking about your own Bible right now and wondering, or maybe there's a Bible that you've received that's been passed down through the generations that records your family's history. Think about the theological significance of that. The copy of Crespin's Bible for us today also reminds us that formatting the Bible for genealogical tracking did not lead to the practice of it, but the practice of it led to the formatting of it. And so the sacred chronology on the front cover offers a window into lived theology of the period and an illustration of everyday Christians recognizing the link between divine activity of God in their own lives. This morning, I will explore the history of time measuring and its convergence with the Christian life during the early modern period in theology and practice by looking at examples of the Bible from the period, like Crespin's. Um, I will also make use of time reckoning devices, including calendars, or all, also known as almanacs, as well as with reference to bells and clocks in connection to sacred chronology of the Bible. Now, much of my research on this topic uh, as it relates to the French Bible is currently underway, so it's a joy to share with you what I have been finding. The early modern period is a rich era to study the history of Christian engagement with time because of the multifaceted transformation that resulted in thought and practice for church and society as a result of a convergence between the Reformation and the Scientific Revolution. The method that I will employ for uncovering the past on this subject might not be so familiar to you, so let me just explain. I'm trying to bring two disciplinary worlds together by attending to the intersecting points between book history and material culture with theological, exegetical, and social history as well. So my approach recognizes that the Bible is a book and that it inhabits the material culture of its time. So, for example, the very first printed Bibles of Gutenberg's press mimicked the style, formatting, and even the writing supports of Bible manuscripts until printed books evolved into their own style. At the same time, the Bible inhabits a world set apart through special function, value, and authority from every other book in its time. And so that no analysis, uh, time and context, so that no analysis of the history of the Bible is complete without recognition of the way in which the Bible inhabits and drives a culture and society steeped in theological conviction and communal confession. Its function, its value, its authority is not merely reflective of the time, but also instructive for the time. The Bible as a book, therefore, is a window into the nature of time and people in the past as well as an agent of change with audience and influence in mind. In fact, the Bible stands as a primary fulcrum through which time is understood and is practiced for church and society in early modern Europe. To further illustrate my point, consider the table of contents in a Reformation Bible or consider your own Bible. From the perspective of, po of book he history, we know that the inclusion of a table of contents in a Bible is for the most part an innovation of the Reformation period. Most medieval Bibles did not include a table of contents. And when they did, they were often misleading since they prioritized symbolic numbering more than the counting of each individual text. So you never know what you're gonna get. The variation of medieval Bibles was a reflection of flexible attitudes towards the barriers of the canon itself. As medievalist scholar Franz van Leer explains, strictly speaking, the canon was not completely closed in the Middle Ages. For a pre-printing age, this was to be expected. The possibility of total consistency for textual copies was unfathomable before the creation of movable type print. The ability to ensure oversight and regulation of copies was a foreign concept and impossibility for this church, for the church at that time. And so there's no one story of the medieval Bible on the eve of the Reformation, except that its variation provided opportunity for rethinking the issue of canon altogether. 
just as the printing press offered Europe the tools necessary to ensure consistency and oversight never before known. For the Reformation era Bible, the table of contents was not merely a list of contents of the book, as we probably assume, but the material expression of a doctrinal statement about the nature and makeup of scripture, of the canon of scripture, at a time when the boundaries of the biblical canon were disputed. And so the table of contents is a statement of canonical conviction in the Reformation Bible. So that gives you a sense kind of of the approach that I'm taking. And given that, then how did the Bible present God's, act, God's divine activity in time through its pages and in its theological context? The Reformation of the 16th century was in a significant way a struggle over the ultimate determination of human time. In 1476, Pope Sixtus IV issued an innovation to the way in which penance and purgatory had previously related. Through the purchasing of plenary indulgences, living people were permitted from 1476 on to reduce the time of the dead still, that were still working through temporal punishments and purgatory. So what that means is that the penitential time allotted before you could enter into communion with God in the heavenly afterlife was no longer subject to the contrite heart and satisfaction of the perpetrator or even to God's will and power, but to the money purse of a human sympathizer. Purgatory was for contemporary interpreters an assured post-life agony of servitude that was to be endured rightly for the accomplishment of human righteousness but without a clear timeline. In this way, ultimately, the late medieval church's determination of the weight of different sins in order to prescribe the counterweight for the necessary remission of guilt was an account balanced within the ledger of human time, a ledger that included time alive as well as time after death. To live in the red, according to the late medieval church's measures, was to extend one's time after death in purgatory, depending upon the nature of the punishments accumulated. And so this is actually one of the very first issues that Luther tackles in his 95 Theses, the determination of human time. In Article 6, Luther wrote, the Pope cannot remit any guilt except by declaring that it has been remitted by God and by asserting to God's remission. Since guilt remission is a matter of time reckoning for life and afterlife, what Luther was saying is that the human allotment of time, whether here or there, is a determination by God alone. The jurisdiction of human life, time, and place is ultimately governed by God rather than the Pope. This is just one of the many ways in which the Reformation Church sought to reassert the freedom of God, to will and to act according to God's own determination. And this emphasis emerges in response to developments in late medieval theology. The insistence on God's freedom was necessarily a rejection of the idea that human salvation was first dependent upon human will. According to the Via Moderna, the school of scholasticism that shaped Luther, to do what is within one meant merit, meriting the first grace of the justification process. And so nearly two months before writing his 95 theses, Martin Luther rejected his own theological formation in the Via Moderna by writing the disputation against scholastic theology. He wrote that in September before he wrote the 95 theses. So it's an interesting example of how his turn away from scholastic theology shapes then his critique of a practice that he sees as sort of perpetuating that theology in the church. Um, okay, what's he saying? This is just one example uh, where Luther is rejecting the idea that divine activity is contingent, contingent upon human action, whether it be the human ability to merit the first grace of justification or the human ability to purchase a reduction of time from purgatory. 
On the contrary, the reformers would teach as a contrast to the teaching of their time that human life is contingent upon God's divine activity. And this is where the Bible comes into play. The Protestant Reformation is motivated at various levels and in various ways to stress God's freedom to have ultimate power and authority over human time. The Bible is essential, is essential in that task because it offers a record of God's divine activity in human history. And it reveals the future that God envisions and is bringing about for his people by his actions and through his church. But the Bible was not merely regarded as an account of God's speech or God's activity or God's promise. The Bible was understood to be the evidence of God's speech as well. To an extent, this was an enduring medieval attitude that continued to shape the Reformation mentality around the Bible. Nevertheless, during a time when God's divine activity was taught as contingent upon human agency in matters of salvation, and when the authority of scripture over the thought and practice of the church was believed and claimed by Protestants to be treated as secondary, the material formatting of Reformation Bibles left little question about who was in charge. Let's talk about title pages. <laughs> In the makeup of the Reformation, the title page is a powerful device for communicating authority, significance, and permission. And this was especially needed for unauthorized vernacular translations, so Bibles translated in the common tongue. Interestingly, Catholic vernacular Bibles had to make their case as well after the Council of Trent further confirmed the status of the Latin Vulgate. So I'm actually going to start by showing you a picture of a Catholic Bible from the time, a Catholic French New Testament published in Paris. During, this is during the mid-17th century in three different tomes based on the Latin Vulgate with some engagement of the Greek. Here we can see how despite Trent's reinforcement of the Vulgate's supremacy, the Catholic Church continues to work at updating the French Bible. The title powerfully demands the respect of the reader by declaring that the correction was commanded by Pope Sixtus. You can see the Pope's named on the title page, yeah? And then published under the, for, under the authority of Pope Clement VIII. The privilege granted by the king and the status of the printer and bookseller in the king's service is prominently displayed on the title page, as well as reasserted in the front matter of the Bible. And so, even before the reader reaches the text, the reader is told that the General Assembly of the Clergy of France in 1655 determined that this project should be pursued for the sake of bringing a, quote, pure and exact translation into the, into the French. The preface then lays out how the Bible differs from those translations that emerged in the previous century. It mentions Wittenberg and Geneva, Luther and Calvin by name and with derision. Yes. <laughs> All of these elements of posturing begin with the title page and its dramatic assertion of authority from the highest ecclesiastical and royal, royal authorities in France. We can see uh, another interesting example of this comes from a Bible called the Benoit Bible from 1566, another French Catholic one. Um, Rene Benoit, I'll talk, I can talk more about that later if you want. Uh, a member of the theology faculty in Paris published his Catholic vernacular Bible and his extended title, see how long this title is, right? Um, this extended title presents this translation as an antidote to heretics who have corrupted the reading of the text in their time. Obviously, we know who they're talking about. <laughs> and the Benoit Bible was quick to emphasize its royal privilege, ironically, until it was censored by the Sorbonne the very next year, because it was actually um, really a copy of the G Geneva Bible. <laughs> this is why they added all these apologetics, like this is like, see, it really is good, we promise. <laughs> it's not based on the Geneva Bible, but anyway. <laughs> Given that Protestant vernacular, oh, I was just gonna say, I have one more slide. So then it's interesting to see how the, the Benoit Bible is sort of uh, taken up by the Louvain um, faculty and they use it as their foundation for their own translation. But um, it, 
they like outright in the extended title accuse Geneva Bibles uh, as being falsifications. So there's, there's just really interesting conversation going on in these Bibles. Given that Protestant vernacular Bibles could not claim the authority from the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church or from monarchs in many cases, they had to employ other tactics in order to communicate the authority of their Bible. For example, it was customary to reference the fact that the translation was rooted in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek in the extended title. And this is a way to link common languages. Okay, so think about this. Common languages to the authority of ancient languages and identify then with the legitimacy of the Renaissance humanist technique. There's a lot going on there. Additionally, Recognized Protestant authorities were also frequently named for their approval of the virgin of the version and its correction. So, uh, one uh, interesting example. Uh, this is a later one, but still notice how on in the title here, there's already you know mention of of Geneva and mention of Luther in this Diglot Bible from the 18th century. So it's an enduring um, dynamic. And so it is not notable that Protestant vernacular Bibles also um, used scriptural inscriptions to make their case for the authority of their translation, right? Since they don't have royal privilege. A study of biblical epigraphs on Protestant vernacular title pages um, indicates a tendency to cite Isaiah 1-2. Listen, you heavens, listen, you earth, for the Lord has spoken. Over and over again, from Bible to Bible, readers are reminded of the words of Isaiah 1-2. The practice indicates one way in which Protestant Bibles subverted the need for royal privilege and church hierarchy by claiming that scripture speaks for itself because scripture is God's divine speech. For French Protestant Bibles, the practice began with Pierre Robert Levitin in his translation. Olivetan was John Calvin's cousin and the first translator of the French Bible based upon the original languages. His translation was published in Neuchâtel in 1535. So I have the title page here so you can see. And it was actually funded by the churches of the Vaudois um, who, would, who would experience ruthless persecution um, in the years to come. Significantly, we can see how the biblical epigraph stands in place, notice its placement here, yes? In place of information about the publication of the Bible. The origin of the Bible is not Neuchâtel, it's God. French Bibles published in Geneva followed a similar pattern of citing Isaiah 1 and 2, and we see this in multiple Bibles. So I've just kind of pulled out a few here. and the Lyon Bible. The practice is not just observed among Bibles published in Geneva. It's also observed in French Bibles published outside of Geneva. For example, this La Bible published in Lyon in 1551. And finally, um, the use of this passage is evident in other, ooh, okay, <laughs> in other uh, Protestant vernacular Bible translations. Okay, so one, I wanted to um, mention one of my students, I told him I would mention him, one of my MA historical theology students, A.J. Mace at Wheaton College, it was conducting research on the first Spanish language New Testament based on the original languages for my graduate seminar that I teach on the Bible and the Reformation. And so for those of you not familiar with the story, the Spanish humanist turned reformer, Francisco de en Enzinas, was encouraged to translate the New Testament into Spanish by Philip Melanchthon during his time as a student at Wittenberg. And this was printed in 1543. The title page includes the brief epigraph, Habla Dios, God Speaks. Yeah? Okay, which is of course an allusion to Isaiah 1 too, as well. And uh, he, so this is at the beginning and then at the end of the, of the Bible. So at the very, very end, there is the, the writing out of the passage itself of Isaiah 1. 
So we see that same thing. In the end of a Bible, it would be common to provide also public information, so you would have a, what's called a colophon. And so once again, we see how scripture is taking the place of the publishing information of this Bible, right? Again, because God is speaking. Um, his work actually, uh, and Zenas, his work opened the door for Cassiodora de Reina to publish the first complete Spanish Bible based on the original languages in Basel in 1569. This became known as the Bears Bible. You can see why. Um, because of the printer's mark. And Cipriano de Valera, a student of Reina's, revised and published the Bears Bible in Amsterdam in 1602. And the biblical epigraph there was also chosen from Isaiah. This time, though, from Isaiah 40, the word of our God endures forever. I think there are reasons for that, so that's a question you could ask me later. <laughs> Today, millions of Spanish-speaking Protestants around the world use the Reina Valera Bible based upon a 1960s revision. So it's a pretty significant one. Citing Isaiah 1 was pro a provocative way then to claim the authority of the vernacular translation for, the, for Bibles on the run. But at the same time, in the case of Reformed 16th century Bibles, it also reinforced the tradition's emphasis on the necessity of God's activity in the human reception of the word as well. Human reception of God's word was taught as contingent upon the divine decision to reveal the word to human understanding. I'm really speaking through, about Reformed theology here. Reformed theology was prioritizing the freedom of God to act or not by rooting the efficacy of the encountered word, whether heard or read, as in it could be heard or read, as wholly dependent upon the will and mediation of the Holy Spirit. So John Calvin explains in book three of the Institutes, without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the word can do nothing. Then by listening to God speak through scripture, depending upon the will of the Holy Spirit, one is able to come to know who God is and what God has done. And meanwhile, that knowledge is, as Calvin taught from the first pages of the Institutes, essential to arriving at a true knowledge of oneself. And so one's understanding of oneself is therefore contingent upon God enabling his divine speech to be heard and understood. Using vernacular language for the Bible then in itself uh, is in itself an allegory for this understanding of the doctrine of scripture because it's not enough to hear the good news in Latin if you only know French. This is partly why the reformers were so concerned about advancing lay access to scripture in common languages. As Calvin would say in his 1534 preface to the Leviton French Bible, he actually wrote it in Latin, so that's interesting. The sheep of Jesus Christ cannot be deprived of their proper pasture, by which he meant the Bible in French. Scripture is the true sustenance, and so for the reformers, the salvation of God's children is contingent upon access to his word, but also contingent upon God's activity in revealing the meaning of that word. For the first two generations of reformers, the evidence of God's act of revelation was apparent by the very fact of the proliferation of vernacular Bible translations, thereby meaning that God was already speaking in a way that could be known by his allowance of the expansion of Bibles in common languages. Meanwhile, those same Bibles sought to explicitly shape and reshape Christian engagement with time during the Reformation. And I wanna talk a little bit about Bibles, including and binding calendars. Okay, in order for you to understand that, you need to know a little bit about what it's like to buy a Bible in the 16th century. It's not the same as it is today. The process of acquiring a book in the 16th century was quite different. At the time, a printer and a binder were separate tradesmen. So you actually purchased the pages for your book from the printer, and then you took your pages over to the binder to bind the book. And so books could be bound with other printings. That's what we saw with the Mobilo French Bible, that it was bound with an English Psalms. And, so, and the pairings or the groupings by an owner gives us insight into the cultural and religious practices and mentality of the people as they use Bibles. 
essentially the buyer had what amounted to a choice in the final makeup of a bound book. However, some practices of binding went beyond the individual and in our case, um, reflect a larger pattern of how the populace was using the Bible. This is the case with the binding of Bibles to the metrical or liturgical songs, but this also happened with calendars or almanacs. In fact, grouping these paratextual elements together also became a feature of the print runs of Bibles as well as bindings. So that's again where the, the practice can inform then what they decide to do officially. <laughs> What did it mean to print or bind a calendar to a Bible? Since the patristic period, the church's role in the reckoning of time for Western society has been primarily driven by the concern for determining Easter Sunday based on the Council of Nicaea stipulation that it fall on the Sunday immediately following the full moon on or after the vernal equinox. I hope you didn't just disappear in that moment. <laughs> The council defined the vernal equinox as March 21st, in case that was a burning question. The challenge faced by the church <laughs> was to somehow correlate this solar and lunar calendars while also respecting March 21st as the day of the vernal equinox. The calculation then of Easter was critical to the life of the church because it then determined the dates of all of the other movable feasts and fasts of the liturgical year. So, there's a, there were a few problems with this. Uh, poor observational methods at the time, uh, mathematical inaccuracies relating to lunar cycle predictions um, that had been established in the sixth century, and the changing length of the Julian calendar's tropical year. And all of this means that there was a 10-day error between the calendar and the actual vernal equinox by the 16th century. If you're interested in reading more about this, I would definitely recommend Charlotte Methuen's book, Science and Theology in the Reformation. It's really a good one. At the last session on the last day of the Council of Trent, the project to reform the calendar was advanced by Pope Pius IV in 1563 who decided to reform the breviary and the missal, which had then an impact on the calendar itself. Christian Europe knew that this was needed, but the introduction of the Gregorian calendar via papal bull created an insurmountable obstacle to its universal adoption in the Western world. The reform of time was primarily entangled in the structural complexities that ensued from the Reformation relating to matters of authority, church and state. Meanwhile, the Bell Wars were another example of how these disputes trickled over into matters of counting time and were especially problematic for bi-confessional communities. During the 16th century in the Holy Roman Empire, it was customary to reward cities for good governance by installing a bell to mark time within the community. Conversely, when a city was punished for resistance or rebellion to the tower, uh, the, the tower and bell were dismantled to show the loss of legal status. So they literally were not permitted to count time <laughs> in their community. To control the bell tower was to control the life of the city. And for communities that had both Protestants and Catholics using different calendars, the disruption of religious life and commerce was tremendous. The struggle to control the, the bell, to count the hours and the rhythms of the community continued to be a source of confessional tension in France through the 18th century. So this is a, a long story. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you the whole thing. The bell, um, so there's a scholar, David Van, Van der Linden, explores Huguenot persecution at the end of the 17th century. So that's reformed, uh, French-speaking Protestants. There he recounts a bizarre story of how the La Rochelle authorities took down the Protestant church bell. The bell was whipped for its collusion with heretics. It was buried in the ground and then dug up again as if it were reborn. Two men dressed as a midwife and a wet nurse excavated the bell the bell was then impersonated as though engaging in the act of repentance for its sins. The bell was baptized, and then it was transferred to the parish church at St. Bartholomew's. 
Um, I was in the south of France this summer, and I was at some of these Protestant churches, and they still remember very fondly when Napoleon restored their bells in their churches. They still talk about that. Additionally, the revision of the calendar was embroiled with theological concern and implication. Methuen highlights how Protestant rejection of the Gregorian calendar was also born out of the desire to deny the sacred time observance through feasting and fasting in relation to saints' days was necessary for the Christian life. The rejection of the Gregorian calendar then was frequently explained with reference to the principle of theological adiaphora, whether coming from Wittenberg or Geneva. Luther, for example, commented saying, neither days nor seasons should be lords over Christians, but rather Christians are lords over the days and seasons, free to fix them as they will or as seems convenient to them. For we know we shall attain salvation even without Easter and Pentecost, without Sunday and Friday. And as St. Paul teaches, we shall not be damned on account of Easter or Pentecost, Sunday or Friday. The freedom of a Christian included freedom to break the break festival time, to break the Lenten fast. And in fact, this was done in the early Reformation in 1522 in both Zurich and Basel as a way to reject the idea that observing sacred time was salvific. And this is where you get the story of the sausage affair in Zurich or, you know, stories about priests breaking fast and eating pigs, you know, suckling pigs. So... At, that's what's going on there. <laughs> at, the same, uh, at the same time, we should not conclude, though, that Protestants reject the idea of observing sacred time at all. Um, and I think really this quote makes us think that they must really turn their back on the, the whole idea of sacred time, of sacred chronology. Um, but that's, that n- interpretation actually neglects to appreciate a, f- a few things. One, the Christological side of their rejection of feast days um, and how that functioned to give the the Lord's day all the glory, uh, so to speak. And so Sunday becomes this this sacred day. Additionally, the Bibles themselves that emerge from their communities and for their communities tell us a different story um, regarding the relationship between Protestants and sacred time. And so as early modern Europe reformed the Western church, it also reformed the counting of time and the observance of time for church and society. And this this shift is reflected in the calendars of the Bibles themselves. Okay, so now we'll get to to the calendars themselves. Okay, the first one we're going to consider is Jacques Lefebvre de Tapla's 1530 French Bible. De Tapla was protected by... Queen Marguerite of Navarre, who was the sister of King Francis I. Um, and so this enabled de Tapla to first publish his French New Testament in 1523. And then in 1530, the complete French Bible with Lefebvre's New Testament was published in Antwerp with, royal, with imperial privilege. Lefebvre's translation was not groundbreaking in terms of being based on the original languages of the Bible, but in terms of eliminating medieval glosses in favor of presenting the bare text of scripture. Scripture freed from the interpretive tradition was enough to earn Lefebvre a condemnation in 1525 by French parliament. Opening the Bible though, the calendar immediately follows the title page after privilege is established. So there's the very intricate title page and then you turn to the calendar. The red lettering gives instructions for calculating Easter with reference to the solar and lunar cycles. The calendar provides dominical letters and golden numbers for the medieval computus of Easter. Key moments of Jesus's life, including circumcision and resurrection, are paired with key moments of Mary's life, the purification, the annunciation, as well as the date of her birth. They're noted by day and month as a point of reference for the year. The rest of the days are filled with remembrance of martyrs and confessors and uh, festivals and feast days. Surprising to many will be the inclusion of astrological references for the months interwoven into the calendar, a common medieval practice that continued for a time into the 16th century. In the end, Lefebvre's Bible functions as a bridge 
between two periods by advancing the commitments of Renaissance humanism to help advance reform in France on the one hand, and also maintaining medieval practices for sacred time, such as through references to saints on the other hand. The crossover nature of the Bible is further illustrated by its inclusion of the table for the singing of the gospels and the epistles in the church. Oh, sorry, I didn't show you these. So this just gives you more of the charts and it explains the solar and the lunar calendars. It gives you the mathematical equations. In fact, it's a do-it-yourself, calculate Easter. <laughs> okay, so I think that is also an evidence of kind of its humanist, and it's done in, in the vernacular tongue, right? So it's uh, an evidence of the Renaissance. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is actually the depiction that you would come across before you start reading Genesis and just affirming God's creation in six days and then the illustration of that and then that he deemed it good. But one of the tables that we also see on the other side, the table for the singing of the gospels and epistles in the church, okay? Now notice that word, singing. That should be a signal to you of its historical context, right? Um, eventually, those, that table would reflect scripture uh, not being sung in church to congregants, but sung by congregants in church. The, mus the reform of music that happens in the life of the church. In the case of, the Gene of Geneva, the scripture being sung would be the Psalms. For French Bibles published in Lyon in the 1550s, this table continued to focus on the gospels and epistles but these passages were not sung anymore, but they were read out loud, which again gives insight into the way in which music was shifting in the context of the Reformation church. I have found, this gets us really late, but this is a 17th century Bible with 19th century hand. Um, so this marginalia 19th century hand um, which reflects how the owner plans to read scripture on certain days. So it's his own plan for how he's going to read scripture. So notice again how then in devotional life, people are beginning to sort of think about the reading of scripture as marking their time and their experience of time. In comparison with Lefebvre's 1530 French Bible, it is clear that attitudes and practices towards sacred times noticeably shift in French Reformed Bibles by the 1560s, when something called the historical calendar began to be used. It was a standard feature of Geneva version French Bibles, and most French Bibles were Geneva version French Bibles, so that's a lot. Um, the council, there, there's a reason why it's probably emerging at this time. The Council of Trent is in its final session in the 1560s, and the Reformation of Time is on the docket, as we already mentioned. But rather than rid the Bible of calendars, the Geneva French Bible introduced its own reform. Saints' days were replaced, and so um, I have actually just a number of pictures. You really won't be able to <laughs> read them, but you can just see kind of what it looks like um, and you'll notice there's just some, um, it, and, I'll, and I'll point out a few different ways in which, um, you know, the illustrations as well as, you know, we have those, those golden numbers again. And then right here in the datings, and then right here is where they're, they're going to talk about which things we need to remember. So saints' days were replaced with historical events relating to the reformers. Um, including Luther's 95 Theses, Luther's death, the establishment of Geneva's Reformation, uh, like a sly compliment to, to John Calvin for being so learned and pious, um, the death of Zwingli at the Battle of Capel, and interestingly enough, also reference to like the burning of Jan Hus. And so the calendar, when you compare them, it's just a window, right, into the mindset of the time and what the time is valuing or what the time wants people to value, what the time wants people to remember as they experience their life. There's also a few historical references to Trajan and Charlemagne. And so these are some favored portions of church history and noticeably others that were more common in Catholic calendars are left out, right? So it's a selection of the church history. Um, 
and sometimes the inclusion isn't clear. <laughs> uh, agrarian theological devotionals also intersect with astrological symbols. So this is again an example of how um, sort of astrological practices um, before there was a lot of clarity of the differences between astronomy and astrology. Um, and so that's part of what this, these, these Bibles included. Um, and so these were usually depictions of the seasons and of agrarian life. And then there, was, um, there tended to be like a devotional element to those. And I will reference one in a second. The scriptural citations, interestingly enough, right, they are, they're from the Old Testament, they're from the New Testament, but they also include the Apocrypha. So they also expect that their readers in their time will be engaging with the Apocrypha and will be shaped by the Apocrypha to an extent. Easter is highlighted as the soul festival. In addition to calendars, time charts were added, clarifying. So right here, you actually have a time chart that it's a very interesting example of this appreciation for the historical understanding of time in the context of the text of the Bible. Okay, so they're trying to explain how do, um, how do the Jews understand the days of the week? Um, and then how does that differ from the way we think about the days of the week? And so it's very explanatory for the reader of the Bible about this, the differences in time. Um, the conversion of Paul and his missionary routes since Christ's birth were tracked in Francois Etienne's La Bible 1567. Um, there you can also find a chart entitled Descriptions of the Years Since the Creation of the World until, until the Current Year of 1567. And this, this chart is everywhere in, um, in Bibles. Um, I'm finding it everywhere. I even found it in the Benoit Bible. But of course, because the Benoit Bible is, a, is kind of a copy of the Geneva Bible, that's really the reason. So, um, but you can see here how um, you have, for example, this, this is counting up, tallying up the numbers of how many years have passed between the different biblical events. And this is the recounting of the biblical events. Um, and this is sort of often commentary. It can be commentary that indicates that there's this difference of opinion about the, the significance of the dating. Um, and then you'll, you'll notice that, so we have from the creation of the world all the way down to um, when Christ uh, uh, dies on the cross, and Christ's death and resurrection, and then that uh, amount of time is calculated to explain how long the world has been around. Okay, and they're very, very precise, yeah? E exact numbers of how long the world has been around. But all of that is infused in the biblical exegesis of the time. The, the Bible is actually giving us the biblical historical record of how old the earth is. Um, and for most of these charts, there isn't a lot of variation. It's about uh, 5,000 years, depending upon when the chart, when the Bible was published. So, uh, but around that amount of time. Um, the number of years between Adam's creation and the flood was detailed with then supporting citations from Genesis. Exact calculations are provided for the number of years past from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph to Moses until the birth and death of Christ with specific passages from scripture to substantiate calculations. The, this particular chart concludes with the tone of certainty that since the creation of the world until the publication date of this Bible, 5,586 years had passed. In this didactic manner, the historicity of the Genesis account was communicated to the reader before they even began the Old Testament. So this became common that you would come across this chart and just think about how that would shape you and then you would engage with your reading of Genesis. In several versions, the calculation is attributed to Martin Luther and the chart is found in numerous French Protestant Bibles. The Christological nature of sacred time is communicated in these charts because the creation of the world revolves around God's activity then from creation to redemption through the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. So the table is not eschatological, is it? It's not about that. It's not about when is Christ returning. 
but it is communicating this idea that, that time is ultimately Christological, right? God's activity in time is to reveal himself through, through Christ um, into his creation. And so, um, so I think the chart really reflects that. And this is significant because um, when we consider different reform groups like the Radical Reformation, they're not afraid to date, to give the exact date of when Jesus is going to return, right? And so they're doing that, the contemporaries of Reformed Bibles are doing that in daily practice. And so it's significant that it's excluded from this chart. They're not doing that in this chart. And so I think that is important to keep in mind. Um, the Reformation also, to me, this is an illustration of the, the uh, concept that was advanced by Scott, uh, Scott Hendricks, that the Reformation is a re-Christianization movement. And so this chart really reflects, I think, that effort to re-Christianize time um, through the story of Jesus. Francois, uh, let's move on. I see, oh, sorry, right here. Uh, no, that's not the one. Oh, these are just all different examples of the same chart. So you can see how many Bibles have it in here. Um, I was just wanting to highlight for you this printer's mark, okay? The printer's mark um, oftentimes can include a scriptural uh, epigraph. And here we've been looking at lots of Perens Bibles, so it's, it, it is worth thinking about the printer's mark epigraph, um, which also cites the, which cites the passage from Matthew 7, to enter by the narrow door, and then it references at the bottom there, John 10, okay, that Christ is the door. And so when you are opening the Bible, you are opening the door to Christ is really what is being communicated here. Um, and so in these ways, we can see how time and this Christological um, reorientation uh, of time is really seen in the Bible, the material formatting of the Bible itself. And so there is an important question related to this, because in historiography, do we see Protestants desacralizing the Christian life? Um, the material history indicates really a different story in terms of outlook and practice. While time was reformed, the sacred chronology of the Bible was reconfirmed, as they also added their own story of the Reformation or their own family story to the sacred chronology of Scripture. The Bibles give evidence of their Christological orientation as well as their confessional context. They present scripture as God's dynamic speech from title page epigraphs to charts linking the reading of scripture with particular days of the week. The twofold knowledge of God as creator and redeemer is captured in the sacred time descriptions of their Bibles. And so Reformation Bibles indicate the way in which the Bible served as a marker of time in itself how people wrote themselves into the divine chronology of God's story and how the Bible contributed to a sense of rerouting time in God's hands and according to his will. This was a comforting message during a period when the contingency of human life was not a lesson that needed to be taught. Um, time rules life is the motto of the National Association of Watch and Clockmakers. And for the 16th century Christian, Time was short, life was hard and uncertain. Society in the early modern period was still recovering from the bubonic plague. And so the finitude of life was often at the forefront of their mentality. This is reflected in art through the inclusion of skulls and watches. Peter uh, Kleitz was a painter of the Dutch golden age during the 17th century. His still life, Vanitas with the sp Spinario, is housed at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. To the left is a reduced size reproduction of the Spinario statue, which is a boy taking a splinter out of his foot, as well as a sundial and a skull are included as a reminder of human mortality. Yet it was not just the art that reminded the viewer of the transience of human life. And this is where I told you I promised that I would talk about clocks. <laughs> In the early 17th century, Geneva developed watches known as skull watches, a practice that lasted into the 19th century. The Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection included a timepiece by Genevan watchmaker Isaac Pinard. 
who was apprenticed to the Genevan master Jacques Sermon. Sermon was well known for making skull watches, a specialty of Genevan orology, and he passed those skills on to Pinar. It has been described that the lower jaw is hinged to the base of the skull to make a cover for the dial of the watch. The dial is engraved and filled with niello, marking the hours with Roman numerals and half the hours with fleur de lis. The time case was an indication the watch was not just about the telling of time, especially in a period when watches lacked time precision. <laughs> a skull alone could surely disturb, except that death was often an opportunity to turn to God in hope. Consider the 1568 French New Testament by Francois Etienne. The calendar offers an agrarian life devotional for the month of October. The reader is told that after the harvest, the field must be burned and plowed. Similarly, a person must die in order for his body to live. Through these means and in these ways, Reformed Christians found comfort in the affirmation that their time was in God's hands. This was the message, or would have been the message, of the divine watchmaker of the early modern Europe. We too live in a, in a world of uncertainty. As I was preparing this paper, the bush fires have been raging. Apparently a teenager, teenage intern at NASA discovered a new planet, yeah? And astronomers have decided that the universe is maybe one billion years younger than they thought. There's a lot changing, even as we experience the other size, side of the scientific revolution. And so the 16th century mentality can be a reminder to us of all to reflect on the words of Psalm 31, I trust in you, O Lord, I say, you are my God, my times are in your hand. Thank you. <laughs>